right, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Welcome to the house of the Lord. Let's all stand. Oh, Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we're all able to be here. We just thank you for your presence, Lord. Help us, God, and help us to bless you with this time of worship this morning. Let us all just raise our hands and our voices and our hearts and our minds and our spirit right now as we worship you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not sins, the sin covering it all. Because we are not sinners because we sin. We're sinners. We sin because we're sinners. That's what happens until we come to know Jesus. And then his blood and his, and his uh, death on the cross cover it all. Cover it all. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup, the cross, the suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. For your will be done. Jesus on the cross prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Can you imagine that? On the cross, after all the beating and the torture that he had gone through, he's thinking about us. Forgive them, not just them, but us. We're part of that group in a way. But Jesus knew he, who he was. He knew his mission. And he was faithful to the end to accomplish the Father's will, to die for the sin of the world. So today we come to the Lord's table rejoicing, but at the same time there's a great sadness and seriousness to it because of what Jesus had to endure to make this all happen and what the Father allowed him to go through it, even ordained it from the foundations of the world. So we not only commemorate, we give thanks for what our Savior did for us. His sacrificial death and suffering accomplished so much. He did it to save mankind. We have received this Lamb of God who was the final and only sacrifice that really accomplished anything to forgive sin completely and to take the wrath that would have been justly given to those who were still in their sins without Christ. So today, take your, your little cup and open it up and take the little wafer out. And this is a symbol of the body of Christ night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let us do likewise. symbol of Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. And Jesus said in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Aren't you glad he put until it comes after until he comes afterwards? Because this isn't the final thing that Jesus is going to do for us. But it is the thing that was important to do and had to be done at that time. And we remember today. Take your cup and partake. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your body. We'll never forget it. We look forward to the day when we will be with you personally and we can rejoice in every work and in your glory and see you and the Father in a way we've never seen you before. We thank you for what you've done on this earth and what was accomplished in our lives and accomplished in the heavens. And we give you thanks today. In your name we pray. Amen.
for this service. We just praise you for this time of worship and this time we get to spend with you. We just ask, Lord, that we just give our pastor your time as he brings your word. Open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to be able to receive it. Father, we just praise you in Jesus' holy name. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I feel like a teacher or something here. Welcome back. Thank you. I am back. Oh, we are back. <laughs> well, I tell you, we were gone three Sundays. I think three Sundays. And hang on. And uh, we're happy to be back. You know, we miss church. Man, we, we had a great trip out to New York. I had to go out there for work. We spent a couple of days messing around in the city and we went to Connecticut for a, a day. We used to look at the fall colors. And it was beautiful. But we got back, we got sick. <laughs> so poor Katie back there got COVID. And uh, I was pretty ill, but the Lord healed us. We're all good now. So I'm um, just glad to be back here, amen? But you know, the guys who were here, who were, uh, well, not just the guys, but we had Zach Williams came and shared the word with us, one of our Plaza kids. That was awesome to see that online when I saw it. And we had Selena preach that one week. That was a good job there. Telling us about the judgment of God, that we're not gonna be judged for our sin, we'll be judged for our works. Um, and then we had Pastor Daryl last week, killed it last week, good job Pastor Daryl. You know what, it's really good that we can go away or just do stuff and know that God has us covered here. We have a lot of gifted people here at Plaza and uh, it just makes me feel pretty confident that as we grow, a team to grow, that we can be able to handle the growth that's to come, amen? And great job worship team, that was awesome, good job. That was uh, <laughs> We worked it to give Selena, Selena a week off to just enjoy it in the audience and just just be filled with the spirit. That's cool. Uh, hey, Bill and Alice, you here? <laughs> they always come when Daryl preaches, not me. <laughs> Maybe they thought this is, this is Pastor Daryl's week or something. <laughs> All right, well, let's 
pray, Lord, thank you for this time together. And it's great to be in the house of God. It's great to be here on our one year anniversary in this building. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to Plaza. Thank you for your faithfulness to each individual here. We just love you and thank you and praise you, Lord. And just let the anoint the speaker, anoint the listener this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever, someone ever came up to you and said, Hey, I left you a message. I sent you a text message. Did you get it? Jerry's famous for not returning text messages. Uh, but, you know, and then you say, Hey, did you get my message? Did you get my message? Did you get it? And then you go, Oh, no, no, I didn't get it. I didn't get it, but then... Oh, I didn't, I didn't get your text or something. And they go, look at your phone right now, right in front of me. See your phone. Is there a text message from me? <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> we say, did you get the message? But in many cases, some messages are more important than other messages, right? Some, someone might say, who do you have on the charger game today? That's not an important message. But if it's from your doctor, say, be here at 730. That's an important text message, right? So, so there's some messages that are more important than other messages. A movie from 1999, some of the young folks in the room won't know, maybe you guys have seen it, it's called Blast from the Past, uh, uh, from Brendan Fraser and Alicia Silverstone. It's a movie set in 1962, where it was during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and what happened was this guy built like an underground shelter and he thought there could be a nuclear war. But what ended up happening is that there was an airplane crashed on their house when they weren't there. No, they were in the shelter at that point, just kind of setting up. They heard a big crash on their house and they thought it was a nuclear war happening, right? So they, they lock it up. It was set for 35 years. Click. They locked themselves in there. The woman was pregnant. They were there for 35 years for no reason because the nuclear war had to happen. So the baby was born in there, Brendan Fraser, of course, his name was Adam, and he was raised in that era with some of the, like, you know, I Love Lucy, the Honeymooners, Perry Como, Dean Martin, and so what happened was when he finally got out of the shelter, he was still stuck in that time. So he was still talking about Dean Martin and stuff, but it was like in the 90s at that point. So anyway, so I said that to say this, they were in there for no reason because no one told them they didn't get the message that there wasn't a nuclear war. They locked the door for 35 years. So the title of today's message is Didn't Get the Message. Didn't Get the Message. And we'll be in the book of Acts. We're still in the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, I took some antihistamine yesterday. I'm a little blah blah. blah. <laughs> Acts 19, 1 through 6. In our story today, we're going to look at Paul the Apostle. He runs into some believers who didn't hear the whole message of Jesus. So Paul's going to teach them. He's going to rebaptize them in water, and he's going to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. These guys didn't get the message. Number one. Get your heart ready to receive. Number one is get your heart ready to receive. And we're going to find that in uh, Acts 19, verses 1 through 4. And by the way, there is a handout back there. You can fill in the blanks. If you guys need a handout, just see Francis back there. But uh, it's going to follow along you know, with, with paper. So verse 1. When Apollos was in Corinth... Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about the Holy Spirit? And then verse 3 says, then what baptism did you experience? He asked them. And they said, the baptism of John. Verse 4. Paul said John's baptism was for what? From sin, but John himself told people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning 
Jesus. So we have a distinction here between the baptism of John. Remember John the Baptist? That crazy guy in the wilderness eating locusts and honey, right? He's wearing camel clothes. He's some crazy dude out there. But he was baptizing people saying, he was preparing the way for Jesus. He says, get baptized. The first word in the Bible for John the Baptist is repent! Repent! And the first thing he says is repent! Repent! Why is he doing that? Because John the Baptist was baptizing people for getting ready for repentance. On your page there it says uh, Mark 1.4. And so the John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance of the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 3, 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. So he was saying, just get ready, something's coming. And we'll talk about this in a second, but imagine having, do you guys say vase or vase? No one's vase, no one's la di -la. I have this new vase in my house. We'll call it a vase. So you have like this priceless vase in your house. It's just beautiful sitting on the on your mantle. It's like it's handed down from generation to generation. Beautiful vase. And one day one of your kids or grandkids knocks it over. Crash. Ah! <laughs> it thinks priceless. It's been in my family for years. This vase is, how could you break this vase? And what happened was. You look at the vase and you say, you know what? This vase is trash now. I'm going to sweep it up and throw it away. No, you don't do that. You see value in the vase. You see that there's something, it may be broken, but there's value in the vase still. It just needs to be given to a master crafter to put it back together again. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus does for us. When we say, you know what? When we're... There's sometimes we fall off the shelf and crash, <laughs> okay? Even if you're a believer, there's sometimes, whoops, we all have moments of weakness and we crash. But the Lord still says, I know you're broken right now, but you know what? I can put the pieces back together, even though it may be in a million different pieces. You're broken right now, but I'm going to put you back together again. Amen? And the master craft, craftsman puts the vase back together and says, it was good that you were broken because in order to receive Christ, you must be broken over your sin. In order to say, Lord, come into my life, come into my heart, we have to have a broken heart and say, Lord, I'm done with that life. I'm done with those sins. Lord, I'm broken. I don't want that stuff anymore in my life. And you're broken of your sin. The Lord says, I'll put you together piece by piece because you're my beloved. Amen? True repentance is being broken before the Lord and acknowledging our sinful heart. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. John the Baptist says, repent. Come on, be broken before the Lord. The Bible says that the Lord is seeking a broken and contrite spirit, a humble spirit, a broken heart. You can't come to Jesus with a proud heart. You have to come to Jesus with a broken heart. Amen? You guys want to wait. You have to come to Jesus with a broken heart. Amen, somebody? Amen. All right, I've been gone too long now. Come on. John the Baptist is saying, you better get your life together. Get your life together and repent. And the second part of that on your page, is said, John the Baptist pointed people to the coming of Jesus. He's not saying only just repent, get ready. He's saying, man, there's something coming you guys aren't ready for. You better get your heart right right now because something's coming. And they hear in uh, Matthew 3, 2, uh, John the Baptist said, heaven's kingdom is about to appear. So you better keep turning away from evil and turn back to God. John the Baptist is basically saying something amazing is about to happen. Something amazing. And that amazing thing was Jesus. He was Jesus. You ever seen a hype man? Like remember Flavor Flav? That guy Flavor Flav? He sang, a, he sang the national anthem in some place this week and it was awful. But, but Flavor Flav was a great hype man. He was like, yeah, boy, right? He was like, yeah, and he, he, he used to get it. The, the crowd hyped up. And yeah, everyone's going, he's a hype man. That's John the Baptist. 
Was it Flavor Flynn? That's the worst illustration I've ever heard of. But, you know, but you get what I'm saying. He was preparing the way for Jesus. said, something's about to happen. Get ready. Get your heart ready, y'all. <coughs> Number two, receive the power. And that's found in verses five and six. Number two, receive the power. Sorry, receive from your heart. You're right. You know what? I changed it. So it should be receive the power. Just ignore that. It should be receive the power. What happened when the Holy Spirit started changing stuff on a Sunday morning here? Receive the power, verses 5 and 6. Verse 5, as soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Let's say, friends, you have a friend. It's a hot summer day. And then he says, come over to my house and go swimming. I, I just got this new pool. And this guy's rich. This, this guy, your homie's rich. He has a big pool. He has a waterfall. He has a water site. It's a nice pool. Come over. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll swim and laugh. We'll have a good time in the pool. Have a diving board. Let's have fun. Come over to my house. You go to the house. Oh, the beautiful landscape. Oh, the beautiful. You look in the water. It's ankle deep. I can't have fun in this pool. But he said, like, come on. He's on his stomach trying to swim. Come on in. The water's fine. You're like, what? I can't swim in that. That's what it is. This is what we're talking about this morning. John 6, John, excuse me, Luke 316 on your page. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize with water, but one mightier than I is coming. Whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. He's saying, I don't want you guys living ankle deep anymore. I want you to be all in with the Spirit of God. No more ankle deep Christianity. I want you all in. These fellows didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. <laughs> Basically, they were, the last thing we heard, the last message they heard was, repent, get ready. And that's all they knew. But all of a sudden, Paul comes along, no, Jesus came, he died for our sins, he rose from the grave, and then he sent the Holy Spirit upon us. They're like, really? Let's do this. I want to hear the whole gospel message. Let's, I'm going to receive Christ. I'm going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening in our story today. These guys were missing something. It's funny. If I'm Paul, I'm walking down the road to Ephesus. I see these guys there. And he looks at them. He says, you guys don't look right. You guys haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, have you? <laughs> I don't know how he knew that. I don't know. They just didn't, didn't look right or whatever. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say why he looked at them that way. The Lord probably revealed to them that they didn't have the whole message. But I just thought that's interesting why he, why he said that. Uh, John 4, 13 and 14 on your page. John 4, 13 and 14. This is what Jesus says. Listen, pay attention very carefully here. Well, let me make, let me make a distinction first. When we are first saved, this is what people get confused about the Holy Spirit. When people first receive Christ, Lord, I repent for my sin. Let's say you go to Harvest Crusade. Someone goes forward, receives Christ in their life. They repent for their sins. Boom! The Holy Spirit indwells them. They have the Holy Spirit living in them, helping them, giving them strength, helping them to change their lives and all that stuff. So John 4, 13 and 14, the water I will give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life, speaking of the Spirit. John, 1 John 4, 15 says, All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. So there's many Christians who are have the Holy Spirit living in them. Hallelujah, they're saved, they're blessed, praise God. But then there's a separate experience that According to the scripture, even this scripture today, is a separate experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we had talked about that before. But not only is the Holy Spirit living in us, he wants to flow out of us. 
I'll say that again. If you heard nothing today, if you shut me out the whole time and you're playing your phone and you don't care what I'm saying, you have your, <clears throat> your ear thing on off. The Holy Spirit lives within us, but he wants to be poured out. No longer Christianity is staying in one container. The Holy Spirit says, it's awesome that you're saved. It's awesome that you have the Holy Spirit. But now it's time to be poured out. What does that mean? I'll tell you what that means right now. It means, you know when we, did, we baptized uh, Sister Kathy, right? We, Pastor Daryl and I put her under the water, right? It's called immersion. All the way in. And that's what this means. This means that when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, that we get fully immersed into the life of the Spirit. That's what that means. When you think of being baptized in the Spirit, it means to be all in. All in. It means that when, when, when you jump in the swimming pool and you come out, your whole body was, was filled with water, touched with water. That's what it means about about being filled with the Spirit means that every part of your life, every part of my life, every part of my mind and my body and my soul, every part of me is now being immersed in the Spirit of God. My marriage is immersed in the Spirit of God. My relationships are immersed in the Spirit of God. My job and my work are being immersed in the Spirit of God. My attitude and how I treat people are being immersed in the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? God wants to fill every part of us to make Him make us more like Him. Now, how do I receive this overflowing power? Old school, you could come up here and put the oil on you, lay hands on you, and ask the Lord to, for, to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Which we, will, we can do that, and we probably will. But in order to receive the fullness of God's Spirit, here's the key. Right now, you're listening. It's not a Pentecostal Holy Ghost, me wearing a white suit, jumping up and down and snapping my foot. It's not that stuff. If you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, here's how you do it. You must be sold out for Jesus. You must be sold out for Jesus. You can't be a casual believer, you have to be sold out for Jesus. Imagine you have a, you're going to a concert. What's a big concert nowadays with the Taylor Swift, right? Everyone's going to see Taylor Swift. But let's say, for instance, you go see Taylor Swift, and you're in the nosebleeds. You're way up there. But someone says, hey, you want to buy a VIP ticket? You want to buy a VIP ticket? You want to go right to the front? I'll buy that VIP ticket. You go from the nosebleed, you come all the way down, and and there's a stage, and you're right in the front of the stage. You can the, the sweat will come off of them. There's, you're that close to them, and you're having an, an experience and an encounter with that artist that you never had before. And you were up in the nosebleed, but now you're up front. You're experiencing more things than you would have experienced if you were up back that far because you're being close, you're sold out, you paid for that ticket, and now you're immersed in that concert. That's what we're talking about, being sold out for Jesus. Don't be happy in a nosebleed. Don't be happy in general admission. Get the VIP ticket, go all in with Jesus, because then you can experience his goodness and fullness, amen? But here's five things you want to write them on the back of your sheet. I have five questions for us this morning when it comes to this, about being sold out for Jesus. Are we willing to pay the price for spiritual transformation? Are we willing to pay the price for spiritual transformation? That's the first question. Because Jesus' discipleship will cost you something, didn't he? It's going to cost you everything. Discipleship, being spiritually transformed, means that you are all in with Jesus. Am I, am I open to say, Lord, change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, 
May I be like you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Change my heart, oh God. I'm sick of the stuff I do, the things that I say, the things I think, oh Lord, change me. I don't want to be stuck in those old patterns. Change me, transform me, move in me, move through me, God. Change me. The second one is, are we willing to turn from our sin and distractions in our lives? Are we willing to turn from all the distractions and sins and is, you know, as a Christian, we're believers, we're saved, but the devil has many distractions to keep us away from the presence of God. Many ways the devil <laughs> plays blocker. Let's say, this is the devil, and here's God's life, and you're trying to get to God, but then after that, I'm just going to play my phone, I'm just going to play a video game, I'm just going to watch TV, I'm just going to do, you know, there's nothing wrong with watching TV, nothing wrong with playing your phone, but I'm saying, but some of those times those seem to be distracting from you giving God everything because when you're doing all these mindless things, you're not connecting with God at all. Amen. Yeah. Are we ready to walk in fearlessness? Fearlessness, meaning that if I'm going to give God everything, if I'm going to give God my whole heart and my life, people are going to notice and say, man, you're a wuss now, man. People used to call me choir boy. I sat in the worship team. I'm like, you're a choir boy now. You know what? Make fun of me all you want. Make fun of who I am and who God's created me to be. We have to be fearless. Don't care what people think about you. Especially you, you young people in the audience. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to be fearless. Because people are going to mock you, make fun of you. They're going to tear you down. They're going to say, your God is not real. They're going to say, that. Oh, right, right, right. Fearless. You have to be fearless to follow the Lord nowadays. Amen? When you're ready to give your life 100% to Jesus and be filled with the Spirit, you have to be willing to be a people helper. A people helper. No one can ever say, I'm filled with God, but I hate people. I'll say that again. No one who's filled with the Spirit of God can ever say, I'm filled with God's Spirit, but I hate people. That's impossible. If you're filled with God's Spirit, you're going to love people. You're going to help people. You're going to be there for people. You're going to have the outflow of the Spirit of God of love and connection. You would never say that we hate people. These are the people God has died for. Amen? I hear a lot of amen on that one. <laughs> Are we willing for the flow to stay open? Think of a, a spigot, like a hose, right, at your house. Are we willing to keep that thing open all the time? Or when things get hard, I'm going to close it. I just got made fun of, I'm going to close it. I'm not seeing any results, I'm going to close it. No, to be walking in the fullness of the Spirit, leave the hose on. Don't stop it. Keep the hose running. That's how you make a difference in the lives of others. We looked at number one was get your heart ready to receive. <coughs> John the, the, the repent death. John the Baptist was baptizing people for repentance and they were looking forward to what was coming next. These disciples didn't get the message that Jesus was coming and Jesus was going to send his spirit. They were missing the number two was receive, receive the power, receive the power. They were missing the overflow power of the Holy Spirit. If the team can come back up, think of a dry desert. A desert, you ever been to a desert? You ever drive to Vegas? There is nothing out there. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh my gosh, there's that street that says X, 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 Z, 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 Y, Y. I don't, know, I don't know what that street is there, but. Huh? Say it again? That's how you pronounce it? No, she's still the spirit. <laughs> she has to give the interpretation or something back there. 
But imagine a desert, just dry, dry desert. But there's a river that's up in the mountains. There's a bunch of snow and rain melting, and the and the it goes, it comes down where the riverbed was dry, and the riverbed starts having water flow through the riverbed in the desert. And what happens to that desert? Flowers start to bloom. Birds start to chirp. Bushes and grass <clears throat> start to grow. Because the flow of the river is going through a dry place. And that's a picture of what God wants to do with us. Because when you walk out these doors, there's desert everywhere in the spirit. There's dryness. There's people who don't know Jesus. There's people there who need a drink of the Spirit of God, but yet it stays dry because the church does not allow the outflow of the Spirit of God to touch their neighborhood, to touch their job, to touch their school. The, the outflow of the Spirit can make a difference if we allow the Spirit of God to move out of us and not just in us, amen? Thank you. 